and Good evening, conservation voters and friends. This is Lindsay Cross, the Government Relations Director with Florida Conservation Voters. And I am thrilled to be here with three wonderful water warriors this evening to talk about ways to protect our waters in the state of Florida. And this is such a phenomenal panel that I get to talk to um, women from around the state who are engaged in water conservation and protection and advocacy work in different ways, but ways that all complement the work that um, is necessary to protect our fresh and our saltwater resources and make sure that we all have healthy places to live and vibrant ecosystems. So I will first introduce our panel and then allow them to talk um, just for a minute or so about their work and then we'll dive into some questions. So I have Rachel Silverstein, who is the executive director and also the water keeper for Miami Water Keepers. We have Kelly Hammer Levy, who is the director of public works um, in Pinellas County, Florida, and Nicole Yinas, who was the ad executive director for Current Problems, a nonprofit organization. So we'll start in that order. Um, Rachel, if you'd just like to give us a short uh, introduction of who you are and the organization that you work with. Yeah, absolutely. I'm Rachel Silverstein and I'm the executive director and waterkeeper of Miami Waterkeeper. We are a nonprofit organization focusing on uh, clean water issues in Miami Dade and Broward County, and we're members of the International Waterkeeper Alliance organization. And we actually have several waterkeeper groups sprinkled around the state of Florida. Um, and we've recently formed uh, Waterkeepers Florida to work more um, collaboratively on statewide issues. So definitely be sure to check out other waterkeepers as well. And we focus primarily on water pollution wa and clean water issues, of course, but also habitat protection issues and sea level rise. And we do a combination of outreach and education programs with scientific research and water monitoring and um, political and legal advocacy. Fantastic. Yeah, I know there's about 10 or 12, maybe even more water keepers in our state. So we're very well represented geographically. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Kelly, um, please tell us a little bit about your role in Pinellas County in utilities. Um, yeah, I have been with Pinellas County for almost 21 years. And for the majority of that, I led our environmental program. So uh, very recently, um, you know, uh, beach renourishment, water quality, um, the development of our fertilizer ordinance implementation, um, ran our stormwater program for many years and including, you know, maintenance and also planning for future, um, future needs. I do, we do a lot of climate and resiliency planning as well. Um, in my role as public works director, um, I, I still have that hat on and I look at, it's, it's very interesting how science transcends subjects. So, I'm, I mean, I have everything now from, from the environment and stormwater to transportation. And yet I can look at, I can look at across all those programs through the lens of the environment and water and how all of our programs come together. So I've been at the local government letter level um, most of my career. I worked at the state um, as well early on. Um, I'm, I love working in my community and seeing the positive change that we can, we can do locally. That's wonderful. And I know we've worked together for starting almost two decades ago, maybe a little less than that, but you, you've certainly been a role model for me as I've worked through my career. Um, Nicole, um, Nicole Ninas, Current Problems. Let's hear about what Current Problems is doing and what some of your solutions are. Nicole, you're muted. Uh, I'm the executive director of Current Problems. Uh, we are a river and waterway cleanup organization in North Florida. Um, we work pretty broadly across the entirety of the Suwannee River Basin. And also um, we do some projects in the St. John's River Basin as well. Um, but it's a grassroots advocacy group that was started in 1993 by people who just were cleaning debris out of the river and wanted to get more and more people involved with it. And um, 
here we are almost 30 years later, we've removed 893,000 pounds of waste that's harmful to our waterways. Uh, we're very proud of that. And uh, in addition, we've developed different programs to um, engage people in this idea of systemic water stewardship. So we have things like shoreline restoration and invasives removal, and um, we do you know, pollution education events with both the public and with the schools here. Uh, so we really, those are, those are our programs. And, and I'm, I really like personally that we uh, get to offer a way for people to actually be actively involved in a uh, kind of conservation that's really tangible. Uh, it's hard when we talk about water quality sometimes, and I know that some of the other um, you know, women on this panel will relate. When we talk about water conservation, it's often these big projects. And when we talk about water quality, it can be somewhat inaccessible. So, oh, we'd like to decrease nitrogen. What does that look like? Uh, how do we, you know, for, for the general public, that's not something that's really accessible for people who like think they, well, I have a creek in my backyard. What does that mean for my creek? Um, can my kids swim it? That, that kind of a thing. Um, so being able to give them a really sort of a handle a, a glove covered handle um, on conservation, you know, go out and pick up this tire and know that you're actually contributing to decreasing, to decreasing the waste in the water. So. All right. Put those gloves on though, right? <laughs> yes. <say>. Yeah. <laughs> so already each of you have, have talked about so many different spheres that you work in and ways that you're involved in, in water. Um, I know that your jobs are really nuanced and there's a lot that you're doing. So I was going to ask the question about what um, kind of a, a typical day looks like for you, but I think I'm going to switch it and see, tell me an example of one of your favorite days or one of the most impactful things that you've done um, in your role in your current job. So we'll, we'll go back to the same order, starting with, with Rachel. Oh my goodness, putting me on the spot here. I need to come up with, with one favorite day. <laughs> um, as, you know, as you said, Lindsay, the day in the life of a waterkeeper is very varied. Um, and, you know, we might be talking to kindergartners or senators on any given day, <laughs> sort of like everything in between. Um, um, I One of my, um, I guess I think most impactful long-term projects that we worked on is actually coral reef protection. And I have a background in, in coral reef ecology. And four days after I started at Miami Waterkeeper, um, started getting reports that the deepening and widening of the Port Miami shipping channel was affecting corals in the area. And so um, sort of dove right into the advocacy work with that and, and got a crash course on um, working with the Army Corps or suing the Army Corps as the case may be. Um, and uh, we realized that um, several hundred thousand corals were actually illegally killed um, during the project. And uh, essentially six weeks after um, we, I started um, finding out about these issues, we had actually filed an Endangered Species Act protection lawsuit. Um, to try to protect the listed corals in the area, as well as the whole habitat that was being buried in sediment that was being kicked up during the dredging project. Um, and actually our attorney, Jim Porter, on that lawsuit, um, uh, who is our attorney on lots of lawsuits, just passed away um, a couple um, of days ago from a brain cancer. And many of you who might be listening might have known or worked with Jim because he was really central to um, to a lot of environmental um, advocacy efforts, uh, especially in South Florida with the Everglades, uh, Biscayne Bay coral reef issues. So um, definitely think of Jim and you know going out on his boat where he was our attorney and our boat captain to go diving to collect evidence um, of what was going on. And so we we had the litigation piece, and we also published peer reviewed literature, two peer reviewed literature um, papers about the coral impacts and the plumes that happened. Um, so it was definitely like the advocacy and the science. And then we did a lot of outreach and education with the community as well um, related to that project. And then um, the Army Corps is now wanting to dredge in Port Everglades, just 30, 30 miles north in Fort Lauderdale, um, also across the reef tract. And um, we brought litigation there as well. And they've redone all of their environmental assessments since we filed the litigation to incorporate lessons learned from the Port of Miami 
uh, dredging project that happened and, and did so much damage. And we, we actually saw quite a few improvements in the recent environmental documents that were just released in late December. Um, so we're seeing some progress. We're, we're not quite there yet where we feel like the project will you know adequately protect the reefs, but we are seeing um, some changes in how the Army Corps is approaching these projects and, and utilizing the science. Um, so you know, I think that we've been able to see um, 10,000 corals got restored as a result of the litigation. Um, the science got published and now we're seeing actual changes in policy from the Army Corps. So we're, we're happy about those. Um, and the battle sort of continues. So we're waiting to see um, what the final revised environmental documents will look like for the Port Everglades port dredging project and go from there. Wow, well, I, I can't imagine four days into a job starting on such an ambitious um, <laughs> undertaking, but 10,000 corals. It was learning on the job for that. sure. Um, yeah, it's it's important to have that that documentation of impact, and so you can have that to um, try and make projects better in the future and avoid some of those you know catastrophes that you experience down in um, in South Florida. Absolutely. Yeah. So so Kelly, um, in your experience, I know there's been some pretty significant projects that you've been involved in, um, mm -hmm. whether it's fertilizer ordinances or work on stormwater. Maybe not a specific day, but um, a project or um, something that that you're proud of or that was really energizing for you, similar to to Rachel. Yeah. Well, I didn't sue anybody, so <laughs> leave that to us. I, I'm, I can't. Yeah, I can't. I can't beat Rachel on that. But um, I think you know when I first started at the county, uh, one of the things that I was challenged with looking at was our second largest lake, Lake Seminole. And um, that hit, that lake has a, a very long history. It actually was part of Boca Ciega Bay at one point in time. It was an, it was basically a, a, a very shallow um, tidal estuarine system there. And back in the 40s, it was impounded and a, and a lake was created. And you know, back then they didn't realize that when you flood, a mangrove forest and mud flats that you're going to end up with a water quality problem. And so for the, the life of this lake, uh, it was pea soup green and it had been studied and diagnostic feasibilities and it just, you know, to death. And we finished the watershed management plan in the uh, early 2000s and finalized a reasonable assurance plan with the state in the early 2000s. And it, it is just, it's been a, a labor of love or hate, I'm not sure, um, trying to implement the projects to restore this lake, which started with um, projects with the south the southwest florida water management district and fwc where we lowered the lake and we we scraped down the shorelines to restore the littoral habitats and fisheries habitat to um installing over 10 million dollars worth of regional stormwater systems and other upland habitat restoration projects culminating in the number one ranked project for the lake restoration, which was the removal of all the muck that was sitting in the bottom of that lake. It was about a million cubic yards. And I know that's a big number and it's really hard to put, you know, it's like, how, how what does that look like? Well, you know, if you go out and you look, you know, to the, um, to the east of the lake there, right on the shoreline, we have a, a dredge material management area and it's about 25 acres and it's about 22 feet high and it's completely filled with that organic sediment that was in the bottom of the lake is now in that in that space. Um, and we are already seeing impressive Secchi depth changes. So the water clarity is much improved. Um, you know, we're really just starting to see, uh, you know, the impacts of, of all of this work. And that dredge material management area is actually going to be incorporated into the park that it sits in, and it's going to become passive use. And, you know, so it's going to actually be beneficially reused for the communities, which I, you know, it, it doesn't get any better than that. You take something that's, you know, a, a nuisance in the lake and we bring it out and, and we can repurpose it for something that benefits the community. So 
restoring that lake it you know it just it wasn't just about the lake because that all of that water that was you know filled with nitrogen and phosphorus was going over the dam into um into boca Ciega bay is a huge nitrogen load to the bay and so we've you know we're reducing that impact we've restored a freshwater resource that i mean we only have three large lakes in pinellas county and this is number two um and we're bringing back its legacy. It, it used to, at the beginning of its day, it was, you know, quite the bass fishing tournament lake and, and it just it just died. And so watching that ecosystem recover with every little step that we've taken towards trying to help it get there, it truly is. And, and Lindsay can attest to this just in all the work with Tampa Bay. It's it's like when when you do the right thing by the environment, it will restore itself. And that's what we're seeing happen with that lake every day. It's like they come back in from monitoring and they're like, you know, Kelly, it's like, I can stick my hand all the way down, but I can see the bottom. It's like, you know, it's, I don't know that it was something that I ever thought I would see in my lifetime. Honestly, I thought I would retire and this lake would still be pea soup green. Well, so. well, you're kind of like the, you're kind of like the mama to Lake Seminole now. <laughs> Yeah, they're 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 lad. They're calling the um, the dredge material management area Mount Kelly. So oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. That's such a great visual to think of. Twenty five acres. Most people can't really visualize. You know, maybe you live on a quarter of an acre lot. You know, that's a pretty big lot size in some of our urban areas. But you multiply that by a hundred, and then twenty two feet high. And that was all the muck that was in the bottom of that lake. So that's just a significant amount. And that may be one of the highest spots in Pinellas County after that, right? <laughs> 22 feet out of the flood zone. It, it yeah. definitely is out of the flood zone. So Lindsay, if, if you need a place to go, just, <laughs> just hightail it up Park Boulevard, make right. a, you know, head north on 98th and you can't miss it. <laughs> I'll bring my tent and my dog, yeah. Awesome. Um, so thank you, Kelly. Uh, Nicole, I know that that a lot of the work that you do with the community is also focused on restoration. And, you know, we're, we're hearing this theme of restoring things and trying to prevent damage. I know um, that's something that you and Cur Current Problems is really focused on. Do you have a project that, you know, was a, a labor of love or something that that you're really excited to share? Um, yeah, absolutely. I would love to say that it was, you know, something like when we diverted 68 tires uh, from being dumped into natural spaces in uh, Lake City, or, you know, some of our larger projects, removing nine refrigerators from a sinkhole uh, that was really close to our spring system, things like that. But uh, honestly, in restoration, uh, it's so much of a collaborate. Restoration only works when it's collaborative and it's systemic and when it's everybody working together. So actually my, you know, one of my favorite projects was uh, this past year, we put together this, you know, small educational event um, that was a haunted paddle on the Santa Fe River. Uh, and I really had this moment where I had this vision of being able to communicate to people who were participating in the paddle, the work that all of the connected conservation organizations in the area do and how we feed so much off of each other's progress in restoration. Um, my organization my organization itself compared to something like, you know, what Rachel does as a waterkeeper is actually pretty narrow. Um, but when we work, you know, when we, we work with our um, Swanee River Keeper regularly on projects because, you know, what we do downstream uh, is really highly affected by what happens upstream. Um, and so it, I, what we did was we put together this little, and I wish I had a little copy of it, but I don't um, I have this, I have the poster with me here, but we put together this coloring book for kids that had this really accessible description of um, all the different ways that we work 
on water restoration, specifically in the Santa Fe. So we have algae blooms. Who's working on algae blooms? Who's working to prevent that, that kind of thing? We got to talk about you know, land acquisition with Alachua Conservation Trust. We got to talk about um, in, you know, uh, these invasive species that are coming in and taking over. Um, and so we got to talk about the work that Alachua County is doing in their invasive species removal and their education about it. And we got to connect with all these different groups who um, have these different, you know, access points, but but are all really working towards the same goal. Um, and in restoration, that's the only way that it actually ever gets restored. That actual restoration happens is when it's multifaceted, when it's sustainable, and when it's done communally. So that was my favorite project, even though it we didn't actually end up removing any trash out of the river um, during that one day event. Um, it, it ended up, I think, having one of the largest impacts that we've been able to have in well, terms and, of global awareness. And you don't know that some of those people the next weekend maybe spent some of their own time going back to those places and were inspired to do that. Um, I love the the poster that, that you shared and the visuals about it. And Rachel, you had mentioned um, having a day where you're talking with kindergartners and then talking with senators. And sometimes you're using the same language with kindergartners <laughs> as you are with elected officials, because you know we have to make these type of things accessible and understand how they affect people in their lives, whether that's making good policy, whether that's sharing with people how they can make changes in their everyday life or spend some of their, their volunteer time making a difference in their community. So having the right, the right language and things that are you know, get people interested and excited about being part of our water solutions is, you know, is something that's that's just as important as as doing the science and, you know, having the lawsuits, you know, you need all of those things to be integrated to have, you know, a system that's working. Um, I would love to go on a haunted paddle, by the way. Me that's, too. That's, me too. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah. We'll so, do it again this year. It's a great socially distant activity. It is. It. Yeah. 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 Sign me up. Um, so each of your organizations are in a little different area of the state. And we're going to talk after this about, about algae blooms because that's started to come up already. But um, I want you each to, to note if there's some unique challenges for your region, whether that's the water bodies that you're helping to protect whether it's based on um, you know, how urban or rural the settings are, what is, what is unique about the challenges that you're facing and maybe some um, ways that you're, you're dealing with that. So Nicole, I'm actually gonna throw it back to you for that question, because you're kind of our, our freshwater primarily person. Yeah, I think um, when a lot of people think about um, marine debris in particular. In North Florida, there's not a whole lot of attachment to that idea. We're not by the ocean. Um, I remember going to the uh, Gainesville City Commission meeting when they were discussing a styrofoam ban and a plastic bag ban, and someone, a member of the community, you know, went up to the podium during, during the, uh, the public discussion time and said, there are no whales in Gainesville. And I thought, there aren't. You're right. I mean, that's, and I think a lot of people have this mindset where if so much of the imagery that we're seeing about marine debris is, you know, oceanic and it's it's actually marine debris, um, that people here in Central Florida don't really have an attachment to that and don't really see it that way. Another issue that we have that's really similar is we have a lot of dumping in sinkholes. Uh, we have a sinkhole here that, um, I mean, we worked on it for two days and pulled 28,000 pounds out of it, and there's at least that left. So um, people just don't have this sort of attachment to the idea that um, the land here is not directly connected to water. I mean, we work in water. We've, we know the hydrogeology. We know how interconnected everything is. Um, but if you live in, you know, Alachua, Marion, you know, Gilchrist, Columbia County, you're like, oh, the river is over here. And that's 
that's where the river is, but you don't, you might not necessarily have this connection to, oh, the sinkholes are actually access points and they're where the aquifer recharge happens. So all the water that, you know, goes into those sinkholes actually just goes straight into our aquifer. Oh, and our aquifer is where our drinking water comes from. That sort of connection doesn't happen. Or um, in the streets here, all of our um, stormwater system goes straight to our creeks. So people don't have this attachment to say, oh, if I leave this can out here in this parking lot, it'll go through the storm drain into the creek, into the river, eventually leading to the ocean. So um, a big challenge here is that North Florida sometimes has a tendency to isolate itself from the problems the rest of the state is facing. So especially, I'm glad that you brought up algae blooms because that's not something that you know, people in river systems or people who live in these freshwater systems um, are seeing until it actually gets to the the estuarine environments to to the coasts. And they think, well, we're not a part of that. When in reality, we might be the biggest part of that. And we should absolutely be not just aware of the impacts downstream, but of our role in protecting it. So the fertilizer from my lawn could very well make it straight into the Indian River Lagoon. The, the 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 thinking like that is something that um, that we as an organization really focus on, which is why initially a lot of the language that we use is systemic and basin wide, and um, it's really talking about impacts downstream, um, because in aquatic systems it, or in freshwater aquatic systems, it can tend to feel a little more isolated when it's lakes, when it's this spring, when it's this river. Um, it doesn't really feel like it's totally interconnected when in reality. Florida is one giant interconnected sponge. So everything that happens over here directly impacts what happens over here. And it's all very, very, very interconnected. And I happen to actually love that about working in um, Florida in particular. No, yeah, that's great commentary. And it's it's so unique to have the, the spring system and the sinkholes and the, the karst geography that we have, because it really is, if you, if you see some of the maps of the caves and the those systems, it's phenomenal how everything, there's just tunnels underneath the ground in, in the aquifer connecting all of that. Um, yeah, and certainly the pollution that's happening in the rivers and the lakes, um, you know, in many areas of the state, it is a problem in and of itself and not just how it contributes to the estuarine systems or the marine systems, but, you know, we're seeing changes in the composition of you know, whether we're having this, um, you know, submerged aquatic vegetation like sea grasses or eel grasses in our freshwater systems that are kind of getting um, out competed with some of these algae and really just shifting the dynamics of the systems. Yeah. So moving over to um, some of our coastal, um, coastal and freshwater folks, um, Kelly, back to you. In Pinellas County, I know that it's actually the most densely populated county in the state. It's also a peninsula on a peninsula yes. with freshwater and estuarine and marine water mm -hmm. bodies, salt water bodies. So are there any um, unique challenges that that poses for you and particularly the, the role of public works and kind of incorporating, you know, all of these regulations? Um, that are at play. I think one of the bigger challenges we have is is um, you know, and, and the conversations already come up about about um, collaboration. And we have, you know, we're we're a small county, but like you said, we are the most densely packed county, <laughs> and uh, we have twenty four cities, and it's a lot. And we we know water knows no boundaries, and so when we're planning and we have uh, 52 watersheds. And when, so when we're doing a plan and we're, we're trying to develop solutions, you know, we, we have to work together. And, um, you know, sometimes it is hard, especially with some of the smaller cities who may not have the financial resources to, to um, you know, contribute, you know, to the effort. And so, you know, how we work together is, is can be challenging sometimes. Um, you know, with the, you know, the fertilizer ordinance, I bring that up because it was um, really something that we rallied around as a, as a community. It was incredibly difficult, um, you know, because, you know, of the pressure we were uh, 
at the time and maybe still is developing in the most stringent fertilizer ordinance in the state of Florida, um, which, you know, obviously the, the industry was very opposed. Um, but I'm a big proponent of source control. And in urban systems, it is one of the best tools we really have. And I say that because, you know, when you look around the state, you know, I've, I've always said, you know, there really is no one size fits all. Every community has to understand their challenges and bring forward solutions that will impact their resources in a positive way. We don't have a lot of septic in Pinellas. So, you know, it's not like other area, other coastal areas where they have tens of thousands. You know, we were very lucky, you know, back, you know, in, in the 90s to have legislators that pushed for grizzle fig, the grizzle fig legislation that led to advanced wastewater treatment. So we aren't, you know, discharging secondary treated water into our coastal systems, into our lakes. We're not doing that. Um, but yet we still have impaired waters and we still have nutrient problems. So how do we, how do we collectively address that? Because as Pinellas County, I, I can do everything I want to do in the unincorporated area. But when you look at that, it's, it's, you know, roughly, you know, a third of the entire county. So if we all aren't working together and towards the coll collective good, then we won't see that benefit. And um, you know, I, that's why I go back to that fertilizer ordinance, because when we when we came together around that, it was like, guys, if the fertilizer isn't on the shelf during the rainy season, it can't be put down. This isn't rocket science. It's just source control. That's what it is. And four years later to see countywide water quality improvements everywhere was just, I mean, and to be able to share that and give that information to every city, to every person who contributed to that effort and say, remember when we did this in 2010, it was hard and we had to fight and we got beat up over it, but now we're reaping the rewards. And when you're talking about a city who's, you know, doesn't have the financial ability to spend a million dollars on a water quality treatment project, and yet we do the fertilizer ordinance and we start seeing all of our, our streams and our lakes and we're starting and we see reductions in nitrogen in our in our coastal systems, all from a major collective community source control project. That's huge. And you know, so for for us, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, rural areas, you're you know, you have, you know, agriculture, we don't have that in Pinellas, but we have a lot of concrete and we have a, a lot of collection systems that discharge out into all of our water bodies. And, you know, I think it's about 81% of Pinellas County was built out before the state stormwater rule was in place. So we have a lot of old development. So to be able to come together and work on these, you know, programs that are truly source control that are, you know, we education, you know, yeah, we have to do the, you know, you know, some big restoration projects where it's absolutely needed. But when we can focus on source control collectively as a community, we have proven we are very successful. And I love that. It's hard. <laughs> it's hard to get 24 jurisdictions all walking in the same line and down this, you know, we're going this way, guys. Come on, let's go. Um, but when we do it, we're, I just think it's brilliant. It, it is brilliant. That's a great way to describe it. And I know that people, after that that painful period, people look back and say, oh, isn't this a great thing? We're so glad we've been doing this. And they, I think they have a short memory because they forget that they, you know, you had to pull them along kicking and screaming. And then they're the ones that are going to conferences and sharing with cities across the state and across the nation, you know, the success of these programs. Um, I did want to note that that the Pinellas Fertilizer Ordinance, as you mentioned, has a restriction on sales of fertilizer during our rainy season, um, June 1st through, is it November 30th or September 30th? September 30th. September 30th. Okay. That's what I thought. So it's not exactly hurricane season, but June 1st through September 30th. And that's been one of the uh, most proactive ordinances in the state, what we've seen, unfortunately, um, with not only fertilizer 
ordinances, but other issues that affect our waters and, and pollution is that our legislators in Tallahassee are preempting local governments from passing things like fertilizer ordinances that really are in the best interest of their community and may have strong support. Um, and that's a place where we are, you know, continuing to say that there is no one size fits all. Let the locals do what's right for them. Let locals lead on these issues. And Rachel, you mentioned uh, before we started that there, there has been some, some bright spots, that there are some new fertilizer ordinances that have been adopted in um, kind of the Southeast Florida area. Can you talk a little bit about that and maybe some other challenges of protecting waters in such an urban setting um, like the Miami, Miami area? Yeah, absolutely. I, and I think that there are over 85 fertilizer ordinances that have those strict summertime bans on application now. Um, but Pinellas County is one of the first, is one of the only ones that actually can restrict the sale because as you mentioned, you know, it's, it's now been preempted um, by the state legislature that, so thankfully we can still have ordinances that uh, restrict the application, but not no longer the sale. Um, but I just wanna start by saying what a legend Kelly is um, in, in, this, uh, in this space and how much she has helped a Miami Waterkeeper in our research um, and our advocacy to bring these fertilizer ordinances to uh, Monroe, Miami-Dade and Broward because um, Kelly was really a pioneer here and also has amazing data. Um, and we can show the science that this works. Um, and um, so thank you, Kelly. It's been fantastic to, to um, be able to uh, utilize the resources that you've provided. So really grateful to you. Um, and, and we have, we've got recently in the last year gotten eight fertilizer ordinances uh, passed in Miami-Dade and Monroe, which we're very excited about. We're hoping um, that Miami-Dade will be on uh, the county commission uh, for the whole county uh, next this month or the next um, and uh, Monroe uh, as well. So we're coming for you soon, Broward. Uh, but, but that would be fantastic. And then the city of Miami, the city of Miami Beach, the city of Coral Gables actually passed one today um, that has been going for a long time. So we're, we're really thrilled and it seems like the cities are really getting on board um, again, because we're able to show them success stories like Pinellas County. Um, and we have major nutrient pollution issues here. So of course, nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus get into our waterways and cause algae blooms. It turns the water green, um, smells bad, it can kill fish, like we saw um, this summer in Biscayne Bay. So Biscayne Bay is naturally a very low nutrient environment, very clear, beautiful water. It's an estuary. Um, in the summer, we had an unprecedented fish kill in August, um, where in the northern part of the bay, uh, that's very densely urbanized um, and has a lot of canal inputs going into it and is ringed by septic tanks, which I will get back to in a moment. Uh, we actually saw overnight that tens of thousands of fish and other kinds of wildlife literally suffocated in place from the low oxygen levels. The consensus is that that was caused by too much nutrient pollution, which slowly, you know, caused more algae and bacteria to grow in the water, the bacteria coming from the septic tanks and um, the sewage leaks that happen a lot in the area and the stormwater runoff that Kelly mentioned also. And then the, those things are also bringing nutrients as well as fertilizer runoff is bringing nutrients. So those four things, fertilizer, septic, sewer, and stormwater are really slowly killing Biscayne Bay and many of these other bodies of water that, that um, are in different watersheds across Florida. And we have, you know, very similar geology. Florida's very flat spongy geology um, where the water can move really easily through the ground. So anything you're really putting on the ground is getting into the groundwater and getting into bodies of water really quickly. Um, and um, that's another reason why our water is so vulnerable to pollution. Because, you know, as Nicole said, you could be nowhere near the coast and still be polluting the coast by what you're doing, you know, in, in your own yard or um, on, at a storm drain at the end of your block. Um, so it's really important to realize how interconnected everything is. And um, the stormwater, the septic, and the sewage are big infrastructure projects that are very, very expensive. The fertilizer ordinance piece is, is a great first step because 
um, it actually saves communities money. It saves you time and money from applying fertilizer that the plants don't need, that you're basically just adding pollution um, to the body of water and you're not helping your landscaping, especially during those summer months. Um, so it really makes a lot of sense and we've had a lot of support for it, especially after the fish kill and the raising of awareness about these nutrient sources. Um, but particularly in um, Miami, we still have over 100,000 septic tanks in Miami. Um, immediately next to the coast. Uh, and because of sea level rise, like they, they never worked properly and it was never very appropriate to have them in our geology because it's so porous. But now the water table is so high that the tank does not have the necessary two feet between the bottom of the tank and the start of the water table to, to filter the waste, um, even to a standard where, you know, that wasn't acceptable, but now it's really just not being treated. And it's basically essentially going right from the tank into the water table and getting out into the canals in Biscayne Bay um, almost uh, entirely untreated. And that's happening in what the county has said is over 56% of the 100,000 septic tanks in the county. So we have, you know, over 50,000 tanks that don't have enough dry ground between the septic tank and the water table and are essentially discharging directly into the canals in the bay. So for us, that is an absolute priority issue. Um, and that is one of our number one priorities to get funding for, but it is a very difficult problem, um, of course, because it's very expensive. Uh, the county's estimated that's gonna cost over $3.3 billion to sewer all the septic. Um, and as the years go on, <laughs> it gets more expensive and this is actually a problem identified back in the 70s and um the federal government came in they said get rid of your septic tanks they gave 500 million dollars to the county to build our three sewage treatment plants to get everybody off of septic and they built the three plants um, but a lot of the septic tanks remain so that's one thing we're going to be working on a lot um, over the next few years is educating people looking at inspections of septic tanks because there's no regulations on how often you have to have them inspected right now, getting a clear inventory on where these septics are, um, and of course, starting to, to get them removed piece by piece. And the county's come out with a plan recently um, to look at where the most vulnerable ones are, how um, close they are to a sewer main where they can be hooked up, um, and hopefully we'll get started on some of those projects this year. Um, but that's really a top water quality priority for us. Wow, over over fifty thousand septic tanks. That's that's a huge a huge lift. Um, I know that we're seeing those type of infrastructure needs all around the state. Whether it's going from septic to sewer, whether it's upgrading wastewater treatment plants, or um, you know fixing the infrastructure that's associated with that. I know in Pinellas County, we're looking more at lateral lines, the the lines that connect from yeah. home homeowners location to um, you know the city or the county line so there's a just a huge backlog of those upgrades and um, new projects that need to be implemented and so it's it's going to be no small feat and I think we need to continue to advocate for those type of things um, at the state level but you know with all levels of government there's a role to play in in fixing some of these um, infrastructure issues so that we can ultimately protect our water quality and the, the health of our people. Um, I know we are, I can't believe how quickly this time is going. I wanna let people know who are watching on Facebook Live that if they have specific questions to ask, to put them in the chat and we'll try to get those to you. Um, but I wanted each of you to be able to, um, you know, mention, something else about your organization. We wanna share the links to your organization and if there's some specific things that are coming up that you really wanna highlight. Um, so Nick, Nicole, I'll go back to you uh, with current problems. We'll put your organization link into the chat, but are there things that are coming up that you'd like to invite people to or you know, projects that you just wanna lift up for everyone to, to learn about? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, in the next month, we'll be moving into Clean Creek Fest, which is uh, the sort of event that we do every year. And this year it will look different. Um, I believe this is our seventh year this year of doing it, uh, but we really focus all of our resources in this sort of small time period on the creeks uh, within Gainesville and Alachua County. 
uh, just sort of do like an all day, you know, uh, clean up a thon and, and hit all kinds of sites around the county that need it. Um, and this year we'll be, you know, partnering with different organizations. We'll be partnering with the Florida Museum to do some um, history on, you know, the people use the creeks all the time and find shark's teeth and things like that. So we'll have that sort of historical um, presentations. We're going to work with the county and do some environmental management uh, little presentations. And so we're going to link everything together. We're going to work with a local art group to have this sort of artistic representation of water quality um, in our urban streams. So we're really excited about the ways that um, we're able to actually make this a really uh, cool integrated project. Um, the thing I'm most looking forward to, I think, in the next year is um, because we are a freshwater cleanup organization, we really want to um, focus on helping people like uh, the man who knows that there, are, who wisely knows that there are no whales in Gainesville, um, help him sort of connect the idea of what debris looks like in this area. So we would like to get a sort of basin wide analysis of debris in our river systems. There, um, there have been, you know, models looking at, at storms and the impact of storms and where debris might, might sort of pile up and occur in a storm event. Um, but there isn't really a, a statewide assessment of, of dump sites and sinkholes and, um, you know, these larger, you know, problems that are, really contributing to, you know, we'll say tires maybe that are degrading and uh, diminishing our water quality. So we would like to invite people, there's a link through our website, but you can report a site if anytime you are on the river, it goes through survey one, two, three and ArcGIS. So it automatically pinpoints your location and tells us, um, oh, I was on the river today. Uh, it looks like it'll take about five volunteers. There's this kind of trash and it looks about this bad and you can upload a photo, um, but that's for anywhere in the state. And then from there, we can link it to local organizations who are doing the work if it's outside of our work area. And if it's somewhere where we you know, work, like I said, we work all over North Florida, um, then we will we'll go out there and, and make sure that it actually gets managed and taken care of. So that's what I'd like to highlight. Um, I think a lot of people think about uh, debris in our areas, especially since we're by a lot of recreational springs, um, like Ginny Springs. Um, think about pollution in that area as like water bottles and cans. And while that's true, um, it's a heck of a lot easier to get water bottles and cans out than it is things like refrigerators and vending machines. Um, and so it, it's really important that we get these sort of, from people who are out on these rivers and out on these waterways regularly, that we get that sort of um, input and we can you know, participate with local communities um, and get an idea for how our water quality in our river systems and therefore downstream is being affected by physical debris. It's also it's also difficult to get nitrogen and fecal matter out of the water, but <laughs> but a refrigerator or a vending machine, I can't imagine the the different tools and you know number of volunteers you need to to haul something like that out of out of a river. Um, but that sounds like such an uh, such a great tool that really connects people with their their local water body, their river. Um, and I wrote a blog this week for our water week and highlighted a couple of my favorite places to paddle. And the Suwannee River is certainly one of them. Um, there's even some class three rapids there, which is pretty fantastic and just a beautiful system. So hopefully um, folks will take that opportunity to look at that tool and um, feed that information to current problems and other organizations that can get out there and, and put some manpower to work. So thank you for sharing that, Nicole. Um, Kelly, I know that uh, Pinellas County has a fun education day that's coming up. And I know there's probably other ways that, that you as a county um, helps to educate the public about, you know, you guys are really the ones that are helping to implement a lot of these regulations that make it set at the federal and the state level. But you also play a role in, in educating the residents and the, the visitors that come to, whether it's the beaches or the or Lake Seminole for maybe a bass fishing tournament in the future. Yes. Um, you know, I was, uh, you know, just listening to that conversation and I, I was, the first thing that came to mind is all the water goats that we're using. And I don't know if you're familiar with that, but um, 
you know, we utilize them in communities that are very interested in cleaning up trash in the creek that runs behind their house or in, they have a stormwater pond that, you know, a lot of trash and debris comes in. And so we partnered with a nonprofit uh, to install what we call water goats and they're floating tr trash collectors. And uh, we, we monitor the amount of trash that they remove every year. And we actually report it on our MPDS permit. So it, it all, you know, benefits, you know, them, they, they love doing it. Um, we put a lot of education out there. We have, um, you know, a, a board that goes up with every, um, with every water goat that explains why it's important um, and explains that watershed connection. Uh, the event that Lindsay mentioned, I, I shared with her today is it's called Lakes and Ponds Education Day. And uh, we started doing this, uh, I can tell you exactly when we started because it was one of the first things that I did when I started the county was to coordinate a day like this where we teach people about, you know, stormwater ponds, but also natural lakes and, and living a, a lake healthy lifestyle. Um, so we, we have been doing this for the last almost 20, 21 years. And, uh, this year, last year and this year, we're, we're doing that event virtually. So the nice thing is anybody in the state can join, um, and it's free. Uh, so you, it's, it's on, it's a zoom platform event and it's, it's on a Saturday. Uh, Lindsay can share that link with everybody if you're interested in it. And uh, for locals in Pinellas County, if you attend the event, we also give away free plants. So we have a, a, a wide variety of native aquatic plants and um, and Florida native uh, plants for um, for developing buffer zones around those aquatic resources. And we have a, a day scheduled that once you've selected your plants, you just drive up your car and, and we put them in the back of your truck or, or whatever you pull up. So we do it in a, in a socially distanced uh, way and keep everybody safe. So that's one of the programs we have coming up. I also wanna take a moment to thank, to thank the state of Florida because they did just recently give us a grant for our FLIP program, which is a Florida Friendly Landscaping Improvement Program. So we're gonna be working in, the, in two specific watersheds, which are have impaired waters um, for nutrients. And we're going to be um, helping homeowners convert that turf over to Florida Friendly Landscaping and micro-irrigation through um, the FLIP program, uh, which we will, um, uh, it'll be paid for through a grant. So we will reimburse those homeowners for, for doing that work and um, then monitor their success through time. So really excited about that. Um, one other program I wanna offer out because it is, um, it is uh, free for any homeowner and it is uh, virtual. Um, as part of our fertilizer ordinance, one of the things that we required, and it, it came out of the industry really, is they said, you know, it's not just us. You know, yeah, we're putting the fertilizer down, but those guys are blowing the land, the, you know, the grass clippings all over the road and down into the storm drain. And we were like, you know what, we don't disagree with that. And so we created a, a mandatory training program for anybody performing landscape services in Pinellas County. And then once we got through the point where pretty much everybody was trained um, or certified in the program, then we started opening up to, to citizens. And while we're not doing it in person, we do have it available online and it is free for any citizens. So it's, uh, it's basically landscaping 101 and following uh, the Florida friendly landscaping principles teaching people how to mow properly, how to trim properly, um, how to not dispose of your waste <laughs> in the street, um, down the storm drain, how to, how to mulch properly. So that's a, a free education event that's available to, um, to any citizen who's interested in, you know, they're a do-it-yourselfer and, and you wanna know how to do it, how to do it right using um, the best practices. So um, there are a lot, of, a lot of these programs out there that are virtual now and available to the public. Um, and I think as Thomas Jefferson says that the, 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 that the best government is the one that's closest to the government or so, closest to the people, something like that. That's how I feel, you know, because, um, you know, I'm sorry, somebody in Tallahassee can tell somebody something in Miami, but are they really gonna do it versus, Rachel going and knocking on their door and saying, will you please do this? I, I think Rachel's gonna have more impact. And I think we have more impact in our communities because we are closest to the people. They know us, they trust us. And that is so important.
That is so important, Kelly. And thank you for all of the the proactive things that you've done. You really have been a leader and, um, you know, as, as I mentioned, a role model to me in, in my professional career. So thank you. Um, I've got some neighbors, I think, that need to be part of that, that lawn care <laughs> class. I'm always walking by going, you can't do that. You can't blow your lawn clippings in the road. So that that will be useful information for for some of my neighbors yeah um and rachel um going back to you any things that you want to highlight or lift up that miami waterkeepers is doing i know that um a role that you play that's different from the um you know nicole and kelly is that you are involved with really helping to recommend policies and then you're involved with um, litigation, mm -hmm. if there's anything specific to the Miami area um, that you want to highlight or just, you know, a great virtual program that you've got coming up. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot going on always. Um, so one thing that's coming up is our annual State of the Water event, and that's going to be March 4th at 6.30 p.m. And I'm going to give it a State of the Water address, and we're going to um, present our, the Porter Prize to Paul Schwepp. And um, we also have mayors, Danielle Levine Cava and Francis Suarez from the city and county um, that are gonna say a few words as well. So definitely tune in for that. Of course, it's usually in person, we'll be virtual this year. Um, some other ways to get involved are, um, you can actually take our pollution training that we also made virtual this year um, called the Thousand Eyes on the Water program. Mm -hmm. And it's specific to pollution issues that you would see in the Miami area, but it really translates to anywhere um, and especially anywhere in Florida. Um, so it's really how to look out for the water being a strange color or a fish kill or an injured manatee. Um, things like that um, and what to report and what kind of information we need to act on um, those reports. So, you know, I'm sure Pinellas County has inspectors that go out for environmental compliance. And so, um, you know, you can report things to them. Um, we ask people to report things to us in, in the Miami and Broward area so that we can get in touch with folks we know at the county, at the state, at the Coast Guard, whoever um, might need to be responding or the local cities, because it can be really confusing for people to remember, okay, you know, I call this state agency if it's a manatee and if it's an oil spill, I have to call the Coast Guard. And, you know, if you call the wrong group, they might, they might not do anything about it, they'll follow up. So um, we try to kind of fill that gap and make it as easy as possible for people. And we've had over a 600% increase this year um, in people reporting. Um, and we've also, we don't have just pollution reported. We've also had some fun things get reported, like um, the first sighting of two small tooth sawfish swimming together in, in Northern Biscayne Bay. During those first few months of quarantine, nobody was on the water and the water was crystal clear and quiet and all sorts of animals came out and people had amazing encounters. And that was one of them that somebody filled from their apartment balcony <laughs> that ended up being in a publication that Noah ended up using the, the federal agency. So that was kind of a happy story. And we've had small spills reported and we've had some pretty major multi-million gallon sewage spills detected by kayakers or, um, you know, lobster fishermen and, and things like that. So it's, it's been a really interesting program. And again, anybody just check out um, the website um, under events, you'll see State of the Water and under programs, A Thousand Eyes on the Water, you can take that training online. Um, and be part of the team and, and anywhere you are, even if you're not near the water, um, you might see people, you know, blowing their grass clippings into the storm <laughs> drains or something like that. Um, so no, no, it's a big no, no. Um, so definitely um, take that and um, spread, spread the clean water love. Awesome. Um, I'm not sure if you see this question, mm -hmm. Rachel, but um, Philippe, it has a question about the $20 million recently announced to protect Biscayne Bay. Um, hey, Philippe, how are you? <laughs> um, so yeah, so this was interesting right before the holidays, um, the state gave 10 million and the county gave 10 million to address Biscayne Bay water quality issues. And I think Biscayne Bay is really, especially after the fish kill, um, becoming more of a priority on, on, um, on the statewide level. 
um, to address. It is an outstanding Florida water. It's the Biscayne Bay Aquatic Preserve. So it has the highest levels of protection and it has Biscayne Na uh, National Park in it. Um, so it's uh, protected. Um, and I believe that uh, the projects are mostly going to go to infrastructure projects like septic to sewer conversion, as well as increased monitoring and testing, especially on the canals going into the bay, which we've really identified as having major pollution issues and implications for the bay and trying to understand why we've lost, for example, 80 percent of our seagrass in the last few years. Um, there was like, I don't know if you saw a story recently um, on our local NPR channel, but the 10 million that was coming from the state looks like it was maybe taken out of a, the coral grant program um, and given to the Bay, uh, but then it was then later restored. So now the coral still has $10 million and the Bay still has $10 million from the state. So we're really happy um, to see that. And hopefully those projects uh, will be a start um, to restoring the bay, but of course, you know, there, there's a long way to go, but we're really happy that that it's become a priority for the state and the county um, to be putting money towards uh, Biscayne Bay because it does bring billions of dollars a year to our local economy from, uh, from our two major industries, tourism uh, and real estate. And um, a lot of people have been moving down from New York recently um, to Miami. I don't know if anybody's been seeing that press, um, but everyone I've talked to that's come down has said, we can't believe we can swim in the water behind, you know, right off of our seawall and what a special thing that is. And my kids see dolphins, you know, while we're walking by and um, they're so excited because they didn't have those experiences where they came from. And so they're actually, they're new to the area, but they really are great water advocates because they understand the value of importance and they really appreciate it. So um, I think we're turning a page, uh, hopefully for Biscayne Bay and we can get some of these, these issues addressed. That's wonderful. Well, thank you, Rachel. Um, so for all of you that are watching, I want to thank you for spending some time with us. If you want to be a water advocate, you've got lots of great links where you can participate in programs virtually, um, connect with the wonderful women water warriors here and the organizations that they help to lead. Um, we also have a um, advocacy tool that is part of our water week right now. Um, where you can quickly send a letter to your, or an email to your legislator, to your state rep and your state senator with some of our water priorities for the coming legislative session. That starts on Tuesday, March 2nd. So just a week from now, the, the legislative session will go for 60 days and we'll be monitoring all the things that are happening in Tallahassee. And of course, working with our partners and our, our coalitions that we're in um, to make sure that we have strong um, regulations that protect our waters, um, funding to support the infrastructure needs of our areas, um, really good strong policies to protect our water, our wildlife and our people. We can't do it without all of you that are here and really wanna thank um, especially Nicole, Kelly and Rachel for sharing uh, so much great work that you're doing around the state. Um, really, it's been an honor for for uh, me to be part of this panel. So thank you, and we'll we'll keep fighting for the water and the places that we love in Florida. So thank you all. Have a great evening.